Well, we're going to be back in Matthew again. And uh, I'm going to turn my phone volume off here so that uh, I don't get interrupted by phone calls. All right. Well, I appreciate uh, Brother Jeremiah filling in for me on Wednesday. And hopefully that was a very informative and useful lesson. I, I asked Brother Jeremiah if he would consider that. And I'm, I'm glad that he, that he did and, uh, and uh, brought that lesson. So praise the Lord. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 25 uh, this morning, and last week we looked at, well, we've been studying the end times and looking at it from the point of view of what should we do about all of this. I mean, I think we can pretty much all feel and think, and, and even much of the world that isn't believers knows that we're in times that are, are troublesome. Uh, a lot of people troubled about the times in which we live, but we, in particular, as believers and followers of the Bible, understand that we live in the end times. And in Matthew chapter 24, we saw the questions that the disciples asked of Jesus. Uh, when will the destruction of the temple be? When's gonna, when is going to be the end of the world and you're coming again? And, and the Lord answered these questions in Matthew chapter 24, and he continues speaking to them here in Matthew chapter 25. And uh, we saw last week that the, the Lord compared the end times to the days before the flood. They were marrying, giving in marriage, eating and drinking. In other words, things were just going on. Life was usual, you could say. In other words, they, they weren't really anticipating that the world was about to get destroyed with a flood. Now, even though Noah had been uh, testifying through the building of the ark and... Uh, testifying of the judgment of God, uh, yet didn't face the rest of the world. They, they just, that didn't, that didn't matter to them. There were other more pressing matters, right? Uh, just going on about life. And the Lord said, that's the way it's going to be in the last days. People are going to be going on about life. There's going to be more pressing matters than the coming of the Lord and the, and the end of this world. You would think that the end of the world would be a big deal. I mean, we've got people saying, if we don't change the climate right now, the world's going to end. And, we're, and everybody's going to die. And there's, the, the earth is going to flood. Well, the Lord already told us, and we have the testimony of the rainbow, that the, the world's not going to be destroyed with a flood again, right? Driving down, we had a uh, coming into Cantwell in the mountains, there was a rainstorm in the mountains, and we had a triple rainbow. Uh, that was really beautiful to see, and so bright and vivid. I mean, just sharp as could be. And, and the first one was really bright, the next one not quite as bright, and the last one pretty faded, but you could see a triple rainbow through there. Really neat. A promise of the Lord that he's not going to destroy this world by flood. And we got yet we've got people saying... You know, if we don't change the climate like right now, we're, we're, we're coming up on the point of no return in which if we don't change it now, there's no return. This earth is just going to, it won't be able to restore itself. It's going to, you know, uh, we've got to get into electric energy, wind energy, all of this sort of stuff. Not answering the question, where are these batteries going to come from and where, what do we do with them after they're depleted, right? Uh, but at any rate... A lot of questions we have, but a lot of people are concerned about the end of the world. Why don't they take the Lord's warnings about the end of the world as seriously? Now, why isn't that the headline in the news? Why do we not have generals? I mean, we've got generals that have gone before the Senate and said that climate change is the greatest threat to the United States right now. Military generals. And yet, why aren't we saying, wait a minute, the return of the Lord and our lack of repentance is the greatest threat to the United States right now. Because it's like Jesus said, we're going about marrying and giving in marriage, eating and drinking and going about business, ignoring what the Lord has said. Well, we who have the word of God can be informed and we are to be informed and what else are we to be? Start ready. Yes, we are to be ready. We are to be ready. We are to be watching, right? Did somebody else say watching? 
We are to be watching and ready, not ignorant and just going about as if nothing's going to happen, but ready and watching as if we're in a state of awareness, a high level of awareness of the situation and the times as they are right now. To be in that level, when you step out the door, well, maybe I should put it this way, when your feet hit the floor in the mornings, this could be the day that our Lord comes. This could be the last day on the face of the earth, a state of awareness that's above and beyond absolute oblivious ignorance to the real situation. The Lord says, watch and be ready. Do you remember in our um, class that we had here that was conducted about awareness, situational awareness that we had? We had the instructor come in and teach us about being aware, and he gave us the color codes. I think it's Jeff Cooper's color codes of awareness, and uh, white is like you're sitting on your recliner with your dog at your feet, and you're watching television. You don't have any idea what's going on. You're just kind of bleh. Right? I think a lot of Christianity is in the white level, We're just not aware. But the Lord has called us, and above that we've got, I think it was yellow and orange, no, or yellow and red. Finally, black was so aware that you, you can't function anymore. I mean, you're overly aware, all right? You're, you're actually in, in, a, in a bad situation. But we should at least be in the yellow zone, if, if you want to use that analogy. We should at least say, hey, it could be any time now. I should, I should be ready. And, and, and there's times when we need to be, uh, you know, more towards that orange. I think we're in that area in that time when we're in that orange level where we know there's a threat and we're making preparations to deal with the threat, right? That was that next level. And that's kind of what the Lord Jesus was telling his disciples. There's, you need to be ready. Watch and be ready. And he also said that we need to endure unto the end. This is repeated throughout the New Testament, that we need to endure unto the end. There's a lot of people that will say, oh, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And then as soon as bad things happen, they run. They're not ready. They fall apart. They, they're, they're not ready to endure unto the end. Okay? They won't be preserved. They're, they're, they're not in that mindset. They're not spiritually prepared to endure unto the end. The Lord says, uh, you must endure unto the end to be preserved, to be saved. And so we're going to start with Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to look at the parable of the ten virgins here. And so I'm going to go ahead and read this through verse 13, and then we're going to go in and try to, try to understand this a little bit better, all right? It says, then... When? When is then? When is then? What are we talking about here? Feast prepared for the wedding, okay, but when is that? When, when is then? That's what it's about. To, when all these things happen, yeah, in the end times. We're talking about the end times, and that's when this is, feast is going to happen. And so he says, then, so we're talking about this. In the end times, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So they got their lamps, but a lamp has to have something to work, right? It has to have some oil to burn. So they took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Kind of get the idea that there were not just lamps with a little bit of oil, but they also had a little vessel of oil. So if that started to run out, they could add some more. Okay, so they had a steady flow. They, they were prepared, right? If you... You know, we've got camp stoves that we take camping with us or lanterns and things, and you have to have fuel to, to burn those things. And it's terrible to go out on a multi-day excursion and realize you didn't bring enough fuel, right? You didn't bring enough to, to fire that stove, and you can't use that thing anymore. Now it's just extra weight. It's of, of no use. You've got to take enough in, your, in, in the separate vessel to be, to be able to add to that, right? 
verse 5, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Who got to go in? Those that were ready. Okay, what is the Lord telling us? Be ye ready. In verse 11, afterward, also, or afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Now, it wasn't too long ago that we had a film that we played downstairs, and I think the name of the film was called Before the Wrath. Do you remember that one, Before the Wrath? And it really depicted the Jewish wedding customs, how a, uh, how a betrothal took place and the Jewish wedding customs and how all that went. And uh, when Jesus Christ gave this instruction to his disciples, it fit with their customs. They understood the, the typology and the symbolism behind it. And they, under, they, they had an idea of, of what to expect. But in our culture, our wedding customs are, are different, quite, quite a bit different, in fact. So what I'd like to do this morning is to start off by spending a considerable amount of time talking about Jewish wedding customs so that we can take what we've just read and, and try to make sense out of it as it was meant, as it was given in the culture and customs of that day because that's what we have to understand in order to then be able to rightly interpret what the Lord has told us. So in order to understand this, we need, we need to understand there's, there's certain individuals, certain participants in the wedding, okay, that in, in a Jewish wedding. And one is, of course, the bride and the groom, well, two, uh, the bride being one and the groom being one. And so that we, just like today, we have the bride and the groom, but also necessary is the friend of the bridegroom and the father of the bride the, 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 and the father of the, uh, of the groom and the father of the groom plays particular importance here. And we've also got the, uh, the, the friends of the bridegroom, the friends of the bride as well. Um, the differences between the customs uh, of of the day in which Jesus spoke this, and the customs of our day are, are significant enough that, that we can easily misunderstand the application of this if we don't go back and understand this in, our, in the proper context. So Jesus used the, the wedding and uh, their customs related to wedding as a type, not only here, but also in... Um, uh, John the Baptist also used it, and Jesus made also reference in, in Matthew chapter 9. If we go back to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 15, and Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and they shall fast, or then they shall fast. So the children of the bride chamber would be the children the friends of the groom and the friends of the bride, okay? The children of the bride chamber, the people that are invited to the, to the feast as well. John the Baptist said uh, that I'm not, the, I'm not the groom, I'm the friend of the bridegroom, okay? And so he made reference to, of himself in this context of the wedding as well. So the way a wedding would usually transpire was that first of all there was an agreement made, a betrothal, all right? We see this much like when Abraham went to find a bride for his son Isaac. He sent unto, he sent his servant out and he sent unto a different land because he wanted a, a bride for his son that wasn't of the children of, 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 of the land of Canaan, uh, the daughters of the land of Canaan, so he sent out. So Marriages were arranged, okay? So let's understand that marriages were arranged. And 
The friend of the bridegroom was a person that often negotiated on behalf of the bridegroom. And so uh, in the case of Abraham, uh, he sent his servant. That could be like the, cho the friend of the bridegroom, negotiating, right? Doing the searching out. Um, uh, as a representative of the bride's, uh, uh, excuse me, of the groom's father. And there's a lot of negotiation that, went, that took place. And so a dowry was often paid to the, to the bride's father. It's interesting, this idea of a dowry has somehow found its way into Christianity. And um, some, some groups are uh, demanding a dowry, but they've got it completely backwards. Uh, sometimes, uh, like in India, for example, non-Christian, uh, they're having a lot of problems with these dowries. Instead of pay, the dowry being paid to the bride's father, the, uh, the dowry is paid to the groom. So the problem that comes out related to that is the groom finds a rich family and hopes to marry into it so that he can be, get a big dowry. He gets married and then kicks his wife out or mistreats her and he's suddenly got a lot of money, right? Big problems. The dowry idea was, is presented so that the father could use the money for the support of the bride if the groom should die in battle or if he should die or if the divorce happens. The bride then can go back home to her father and there's support that's been raised on her behalf ahead of time as an insurance policy, if you will. So that was the idea of a biblical dowry that it's given to the father of the bride for securing a future for that bride in the event that that husband, something should happen to him or that marriage relationship, okay? And so uh, if you go to Genesis 24 and verse 53, we see a reference to this, Genesis 24 and verse 53. So with the betrothal, an agreement is made and a dowry is uh, agreed upon. Genesis 24 and verse 53. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And so we see a, a hint of this. We're in Matthew chapter 25 talking about the parable of the uh, ten virgins. And so if the suitor, the groom, the one hoping to marry this young lady, was poor, they had to make uh, other arrangements. So maybe he didn't have anything to give other than service. Okay, what did Jacob do for his wives? He, he gave seven years of service for uh, each of the two wives that he got from Laban. So there, there could be arrangements that were made. Um, the bride's father could also give a gift to the bride, to that fund as well. So as a part of the betrothal, these arrangements are being made. They haven't gotten married yet, but the, the family is making these arrangements for this couple. The groom has said this, you know, uh, um, the, the father of the groom has, has made arrangements, selected a wife or a family from which the wife should come for his son. He makes this arrangement, and they get together, the fathers, the families, they negotiate, they come up with a dowry that's to be set aside. You know, what if uh, this young woman is from a very wealthy family and she's used to a certain standard of living and the groom is from a very poor family and he can't afford that? The family's got to work this out, right? They've got to they got to work. How's this going to work? And the goal was to make sure that the, the bride would be cared for. And I think there's a principle there. I, I don't think that, that the dowry is necessarily something that has to be adhered to, like some groups are doing today. But there's a principle there, and that is that... Um, Young ladies and their parents should make sure that the husband is able to support his family, okay? He has some means or is going to have some means to support his family. Now, 
They also, marriages between close relatives were forbidden, but nevertheless marriages were arranged within the clan, all right? And, and the big principle there was marriages outside of the clan or outside of the nation of Israel were forbidden because what happens then that if you married that one from outside the nation of Israel, they might bring, that, that woman might bring her false gods in with her. And so the whole community had a vested interest in making sure that these marriages were within the faith and would keep the faith. This home would keep the faith. And the, the introduction of other gods would affect the religious life of the whole people. And of course, Israel suffered from this numerous times throughout their history when they became lax in this and started intermarrying with the groups uh, the strangers, the neighbors that were around them, the other countries surrounding them. So once these arrangements for a marriage had been uh, uh, made, a betrothal agreement would be entered into. And interestingly, this was more binding, much more binding than, for, for example, an, in, an engagement in our society today. You know, uh, in our society today, Pretty much the parents can be left out of it, and, we, and it's just accepted that this is between the groom and his bride. And the engagement is a promise between those two, but in, this, in the Jewish situation, it was between family and family, a formal contract was dra drafted up, a, a betrothal, and in this betrothal arrangement, there, was, there were conditions. And it was binding, and you could not be released from this betrothal arrangement except under certain conditions. It was very binding. Um, it, it took legal action to break the betrothal arrangement. In other words, basically a divorce. And sometimes you'll see divorce mentioned in relation to not the marriage, but the betrothal agreement, okay? And so it would take a legal action to break this betrothal. And the grounds for breaking it could be adultery. And uh, in certain cases, it could involve the death penalty. Okay, so was an, an engagement, a betrothal, a serious thing? It could involve the death penalty. If we go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 22. Deuteronomy 22. This is the, the grounds and the foundation for much of the the construction or or, or if you will the the uh, our way of thinking in the western world today it's it's much it's the biblical grounds for marriage is is ingrained in our way of thinking to a certain extent and we've veered away from this to a certain extent and um, nevertheless the, our perceptions of what is good and proper in relation to marriage are, are based on what the Lord gave to the children of Israel. If we go to Deuteronomy 22, and beginning in verse 23, if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, in other words, she's engaged, she's betrothed, that this agreement has been made, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out into the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. So even in the betrothal situation, she was considered to belong to, if you will, uh, to the, the groom, the one that had, had been espoused unto her. All right, so this is a case of, um, basically, it, it's the same penalty as adultery. All right, so because of, they're not married yet, they're espoused, they're betrothed, and they are, uh, the death penalty for, for adultery is applied. In verse 25, but if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, so not in the city, but out in the field, and the man force her and lie with her, so in other words, this is a, a situation of rape, then the man only that lay with her shall die, but unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death, for as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. 
For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So we see that the betrothal, the, the espousal, was um, a very serious agreement. It was binding. And this betrothal could last a whole year. Okay, So in other words, if you would put it in today's terms, the, the engagement could last a whole year. All right, so when, when this betrothal is made, the announcement is made that uh, this is, uh, the, the agreement has been made, then everybody understood, well, this isn't going to take place today, right, or, or generally. Uh, it's going to pl take place sometime in the future. There's some things that need to be done in the meantime. And so the things that, during this time, the groom was to prepare a place for his bride. I mean, it wasn't like we do today. Uh, in our culture today, it's acceptable, and sometimes it's viewed as, uh, oh, this is great, oh, this is true love, that uh, got no place to live, got no future, got no, got no job, got no education, but we're going to get married and we'll sort it out. We're going we're gonna to live together on love, right? And that's accepted today, not in Jewish custom, and not according to the and, and the Jewish custom is what is used to describe to us the picture of Christ and his church. And so that's where we have to get our mind wrapped around. This is what the Lord established for Israel so that it could be a picture and we can understand better what is to happen when the Lord returns, okay? And the Lord's using this as a description of what's going to happen in the end days. In John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. See, this is very much along the lines of the picture of the groom preparing a place for his bride. And that's what Jesus Christ is said to be doing right now. It's he's preparing a place for his bride. And we know that he's coming again to receive his bride unto himself. And that's his, the purpose of God. And that's been God's purpose all along. And Jesus Christ is, uh, has been sent, prepared, uh, is for us to, to have a people unto himself. So... It wasn't up to the groom to determine when the new home was ready for the bride. So, so here's the, the, the arrangement is made. The father goes and tells the son, I've got a bride for you. Uh, she's all picked out. The arrangements have been made. Now you need, you need to get ready. Make a place ready. And so again, I've, I've read various commentaries. One says, well, it's up to the father of the groom to go in and look and say, okay, well, I think you're ready to receive your bride I read other commentaries that say, well, it's up to the bride, the bride's father, to come in and say, okay, yeah, this is suitable for my daughter, and uh, looks like you've gotten yourself ready. Uh, now my daughter can come, uh, you can come claim your bride when you're ready. And so this could take some time. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with long engagements, okay, because sometimes they're necessary. We tend to say, don't do a long engagement today because uh, of cer certain passages in scriptures which where the Apostle Paul said, uh, better for them to marry than to burn, okay? Um, hopefully we can train our kids, I say hopefully, we're all human, okay? Well, we can train our kids to, to realize the importance of waiting, all right? That's, that's in our society today, abstinence is not taught. I mean, we teach every other thing to the point of perversion in our schools, but why aren't we teaching abstinence? It's not taught. And we, that should be something that's valued and taught, okay, with our children. So they, they could wait a whole year. And so in the meantime, the friends of the bride, the friend of the bridegroom, friends of the bride, they're knowing that this process is going on, a place is being prepared, but they don't know the exact day when the, whether it's the father of the groom or the father of the bride, say, okay, the place is ready, and tell the groom, you can go get your bride. But they know, they, they, they say, well, we know the agreement was made on this day. I went by his house. He's looking pretty ready. I see signs that he's ready. He's getting everything ready. And uh, I see indications that it could be really soon, 
We need to be ready for this wedding. What if you got an invitation to a wedding? And what do we do for a wedding? We get dressed up, we prepare gifts, we, we maybe prepare some food if it's a potluck, but we know that we've got to schedule out some time and we're going to go be a participant in this wedding uh, celebration, right? Uh, so you make yourself ready, right? Well, what if you didn't know the exact date? You didn't know the exact hour. And yet you were just told, so-and-so and such-and-such, you're getting married. Watch for indications of when this might be and the exact time of when it's going to be. We'll let you know by crying out and coming around and saying, hey, time for the wedding. Wouldn't that be an interesting thing? You're out working away in your field or, or you're working away in your garage or in your yard or, or you're at work uh, or usually it was in the evening when people would be home you're sitting at home you're, or you're just doing things at home and suddenly you get a phone call. Hey, the wedding's on. Get over here. You got about an hour. <laughs> That's kind of what uh, the Jewish customs were like. I mean, there were indications. People could look at what was going on and say, hey, it's going to be pretty soon. We should be ready. I got my gift prepared or, or I've got my clothes laid out or you know, I've got oil in my lamp. All right. I've got my lamp because I know it's going to be at night. I'm ready. All I got to do is call, and, I'll, and I'm going. I'm ready. And that's the analogy. That's the picture that's given to how we should be ready for when the Lord comes to receive his people unto himself, especially his bride. We need to be ready. We need to be watching. So according to Jewish tradition, uh, the groom's father could announce that the procession to go get the bride could begin. And so what would happen is the groom would go from this place that he's prepared, he'd go to the bride's father's house, say, I'm here to get my bride. And she needed to be ready too. And they need to, needed to be ready. Again, there'd be some indications that, you know, they, they wouldn't be completely surprised uh, because they had already looked and said, okay, his, his house is ready. It's, it's all ready here, all right? It could be any time. And whenever the father says, Go get your bride. That's when it's going to happen. So he goes and he says, I'm here to get my bride. And everybody's there and they say, you know, she gets all decked out. And, and uh, the groomsmen would be going shouting in advance as the, as the groom goes to get his bride. There's a procession saying, he's going to get his bride. He's coming to, he's coming to get his bride. And, and they're going to get her. You know, in, in Russian wedding customs, we got to be involved in several Russian weddings. It's kind of like this still today. Uh, they would make the announcement, and the groom had to go to the bride's house, and tradition was he was met at the door by the bride's father. Meanwhile, the bride's friends are... as. Uh, the young ladies that were friend of the, uh, of the uh, bride, they did everything in their power to make it difficult for the groom to get there. They would pull all kinds of pranks. They would sabotage the stairways going up to the apartment. They would, they would have so much fun trying to sabotage the groom. They would make him work to be able to get to the house so that he could go collect his bride to go down to the registry office to have the wedding. And this was part of their culture even today. And they had a lot of fun doing this. And so then when they got to the door, of course, the bride's father answered the door. What do you have? What of value do you have to give me for my daughter? And of course, that was their tradition. He had to come up with money or, or, the, or the bride's father could say, well, I think, and, and the bride's mother could also say, well, I think, really, that you need to give me a bouquet of flowers. So he had to have flowers for the mother when he came to the door. He had to have money for the father. He had to come bearing gifts, okay? And um, the mother and father could make it, you know, they had a lot of fun doing this as well, <laughs> trying to make it just awkward and difficult for this poor groom to, to collect his bride. Of course, in the end, they would, they would all say, well, okay, you know, and they'd, they'd jump in the car and they'd go down to the registry and, and, and have the wedding ceremony. But it, this is, kind of comes from this Jewish custom of the groom going to the bride's 
house, the house of her father, and collecting his bride, and there's this pr procession. If we go to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, we see this as well. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And beginning in verse 16, it says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. What did the Lord say? I've gone to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I'll come again to receive you unto myself. So the Lord's going to come again, right? He's going to descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of, an arch, of the archangel, and with the trump of God. It's kind of like this groom going to collect his bride, and everybody shouting, he's coming, he's, gonna, he's coming to collect his bride. And, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. See, the Lord's coming back for his bride someday. And this picture speaks of this. Well, in the evening, when the bridegroom would set out from his home and fetch his bride from her parents' house, this, there would be a pro procession, a parade of friends that would accompany the, company, uh, the couple as they would walk back to the bride's new home, the place where uh, the, the, the groom is prepared for his bride. So we're talking about the groom and the bride, but there's a lot of other people Friends of the bridegroom, friends of the bride, they're all a part of this procession, okay? They're all a part of this gathering together and going to the place that the Lord has, that the, the groom has prepared. And that's the context that we have our, our parable here of the ten virgins. Well, in this parable, some of the guests were ready. They had their lamps and they had their oil. And they were ready for as long as it took. They were ready as they were waiting for the groom to come get his bride. Others, they had their lamps, but they didn't have the oil. Okay, so they weren't ready. They thought they were ready. They thought they would be ready. They thought maybe, well, at the last minute, okay, you get the analogy here. At the last minute, I'll do something about this. How many times have you witnessed to people, and they've, uh, have you ever done this perhaps, and witnessed somebody, and they said, well, when I see the signs of the times and the mark of the beast and all that, then, then I'll repent and I'll quit my lifestyle and I'll go on. I've had people tell me that. Now, that's about the most foolish thing you could, could think in your life because you don't know. None of us know. You don't know when the Lord's just going to take you out like that. And your, your opportunities are over. And so here we have the, the, the five foolish virgins who they've got their lamp but they don't have the oil. They don't have the oil to go with it. So this procession is ready. On, uh, there's two groups. On the groom's side, there's the friends of the bridegroom. On the bride's side, there were the friends of the bride. In this case, this would be the, the ten virgins. And together, they're all considered to be the children of the bride chamber. Now, this wasn't a solemn procession. I'm going to get my bride. Bom, 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 bom. Oh, it was a happy jumping up and down, woohoo! tooting of horns and trumpets, and he's going to get his bride. This was a celebration, and when he gets his bride, they're going back, and everybody is jumping up and down and dancing and having a great celebration all the way back to the, to the groom's home, okay? You ever seen a Jewish wedding? They do a lot of jumping up and down. <laughs> they do a lot of jumping up and down. It's a happy time, okay? And it should be a happy time. This is a marvelous thing, a wedding, a, a, a celebration. It should be a marvelous thing. Then they would have, they would get to the groom's home, and the vows would be repeated. There had already been vows made. Not the vows of the wedding covenant, but the vows of betrothal, okay? But now they're going to make the wedding vows. And that's really, even today, that is the essence of a wedding. It's the vows. That is the important part of wedding. That's why we have witnesses. It's the swearing and the vowing of yourself to another for as long as you shall live. That is the essence of what a wedding is. I've had people say, I don't need no piece of paper to tell me that I'm married to my wife. 
Well, you do. <laughs> you do. It, because that is the documentation of the vows that were made. And without the vow, there really, truly is no wedding. Now, yes, in God's eyes, he sees this. And if you were in the wilderness and there was no, no registry of m m way to, to document that the vows had been made, then it's a vow between you and God. But somehow or another, when you get back into civilization, that vow has to be recognized. And so we have a way of doing that through a marriage license, OK? So the vow is the essence of the wedding ceremony, is that vow. And that would be made where? In the temple? No, in the home. It wasn't until recent history, even in Jewish weddings, that weddings were started to be done in the synagogue or in, in the temple. My personal opinion, and I don't have the facts to back this up, but you can look this up if you want to check it out, but my personal opinion is the idea of having a wedding in a church building is a vestige of Catholicism so that you bind the husband and wife to the church at the same time as they make a vow to each other. And you must have a priest to officiate that in order to, I've had people tell me today, you can't be married unless it's done in a church. There's no biblical basis for that whatsoever. They were all done in the home. And with the witnesses of the community, and in particular the, the two families involved, that was, that was the essence of the documentation and the witness of the vows that were made. And so we need to be careful about this today, too. <laughs> And again, that's just another example of the baptism of infants. Weddings can't be performed unless they're performed by a priest and in the church. Now, I think it's totally appropriate. Don't get me wrong. I think it's totally appropriate for a wedding to, be take, to take place in a church building. That's a great place to have that. Because voluntarily vowing themselves together before God, recognizing God in that marriage, that's a great thing, okay? Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying church weddings are not valid or anything like that. I'm just saying that the emphasis can be shifted really quick. Uh, and we, we lose even the picture of what the Lord is presenting here in Matthew chapter 25, OK? Um, the wedding was essentially non-religious. Uh, the bride and the bridegroom would be all decked out in Isaiah 61 and verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed, clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. You know, there, this was a cause for celebration. It was a big event. It was, they got all decked out. We see the clothing here with a robe of righteousness. We see ornaments and jewels. That we could equate that spiritually, the robe of righteousness, salvation in Jesus Christ, being betrothed unto him, having the jewels of service and um, uh, sacrifice given unto the Lord. We, we see the, the characters in this analogy that are given, and we could, you can make a whole separate study in this, and, and again, my emphasis in the last times has been more towards what should we do about this, as opposed to when is this going to be exactly, and, and things like that, okay? So instead of spending a lot of time in the, in the types and the pictures, I'm going to mention them, but, but we're going to look at the bigger picture here. I think it's pretty clear to us, and, and I think we've all seen these pictures before and had them explained to us, that the father in this wedding situation is God the father, okay? So the father is the father of the groom, is God the father. He has appointed a bride for his son, Jesus Christ. God is very much involved in the choosing forth of his bride, of the bride for his son. And of course, the bridegroom is Jesus Christ. He has paid the price for his bride. He has given his life for his bride, his own blood. Who is the friend of the bridegroom? Remember? Who said he was the friend of the bridegroom? 
John the Baptist. He's friend of the bridegroom. He, he kind of negotiated on behalf of the father of the, of the groom and the, the, the bride-to-be, right? How did he do that? How did John the Baptist negotiate? What did John the Baptist do? Prepared a way. Prepared material for the church. How did he do that? What's that? But who did he baptize? What did he do before he baptized? Preached repentance. Yeah, so we see here, the friend of the bridegroom has done the negotiating, and his negotiating is through repentance, preaching repentance, preaching that souls should, should turn from their sin. He's prepared the material from which Christ has called his church. You know, the Apostle Paul claimed, also claimed this role as a friend of the bridegroom, so to speak. He didn't come right out and say this. But when he said to the church in Corinth, I have espoused you unto one husband. I, I've betrothed you, espoused you to your husband. He, he's kind of acting in that role as well as the friend of the bridegroom in the preaching of the gospel and, and preparing so in this Jewish celebration, the pinnacle of the celebration was the wedding feast. Uh, we can go to Matthew chapter 22 and see more details about the wedding feast. And so the vows are made, and then there's a celebration, a feast that takes place. Now, we'll, we'll read about this in Matthew 22, beginning in verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. So we see here it's, it's arranged, right? And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage." But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Of course, there's a lot of typology in this with Israel being first bidden, but then rejecting the prophets of God. And so now we see that the invitation is opened up to all. Go ye therefore unto the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. So now we have another party in this marriage and that's not the bride, and that's not the groom, that's not the friends of the bridegroom, and are not the friends of the bride, but we have guests, just guests, okay? Guests that are brought to the table. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him out in, into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. All right, so here we see some people assuming to be guests, but not submitting to the requirements of the feast. And what happened with them? Cast out. What is related to weeping and gnashing of teeth? There's people who, in this town who don't understand this verse that I've met claiming to be independent Baptists. They don't understand this verse. They said, well, they call us Baptist brighters, and they say, well, you're saying that those that, are, that come, uh, that, that there's going to be saved people in heaven who are cast into outer darkness and there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I say, no, that's hell. Where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's not heaven. So we're saying that there's a lot of people that claim to be saved but aren't. They don't submit to repentance. They, they, they're, they're going in under false pretenses, under their own saying, my clothes are good enough. My robe is my righteousness, and that's going to be good enough. And the, and the, and the, the father says, no, it's not. <laughs> you have to put on my robe, and that's the robe of righteousness by the blood of Jesus Christ. 
So many guests are invited, and they come and they have this wedding, but not everybody that wants to get in will get in. And some will get in only to be found that they have to be kicked out, okay? They're not acceptable for the feast. But hold in mind, the world today will take and say, well, all of these virgins are everybody that's saved, and they equate that to be what they call the universal invisible church of God, or the Catholics say it's the universal visible church of God. But mind you, there is one groom, one bride, okay, and there are guests, and they all get to go to the feast. We're going to see that in heaven with Christ, his church, and the rest of the saved, okay? And, but they're all in heaven. They're all at the feast. But there's a special place for that church. Now, I know this puts us now in a category that most other Baptists disdain and hate, okay? But that's, the, that's how this all falls out as we look at this. These virgins, these foolish virgins, they looked ready. And this parable of the ten virgin, virgins is meant to reinforce Force the principle that we've already encountered as the Lord was teaching his disciples and answering this question, and that is, you need to be ready. All right, that's, that's the real simple application of this parable. Like I said, we can get into the details, but we better understand the simple application first and then get into the details. And the simple application is, be ready. Are we ready? Are you ready? Is the world around us ready? Do the people, are the people that we know ready? Because the Lord can come when we do not expect it, but we see the signs. We know he's gone to prepare a place. He's been there preparing a place, and he said he's coming back. Are we looking for that? Are we anticipating that? And there were those who said, oh, I'm ready. I got my lamp. Got my lamp. Praise God. Hallelujah. I got my lamp. I'm ready. He comes. They got no oil. That lamp's no good unless it's got something to burn inside of it, right? They had the appearance of being ready, but they weren't ready. They had no oil. They had no oil for that lamp. Again, same way I closed out last week's lesson, there are many that profess salvation, but not all that profess salvation are saved. In the Bible, and I'll just give you this really quick, 1 Samuel 16, 13. It read, we read about Samuel. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up, rose up and went to Ramah. Oil was used to anoint, and with that anointing came the, the Spirit of God upon David. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, the, the Lord said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So we see the Spirit of the Lord related to anointing, and anointing is done with oil. Okay, Oil in the lamps was is also, we can show that as a an illustration of having a profession of salvation, but not the Holy Spirit, an indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God, so that you're ready for when the Lord comes. The only way to get the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God is to become a child of God and be endued in, uh, and filled with that Spirit at the moment of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. First of all, you've got to be saved. So there's going to be people who try to go to the wedding that aren't saved, but have a testimony of salvation, but aren't saved. And they need to, uh, we, we, and that's part of the Lord's warning. Be ready. Watch. Be ready. And you could also say that those five foolish virgins could not endure unto the end because they didn't have the oil. They didn't have the Spirit of God. And what, what did the Lord say in the very beginning of this lesson here, he said, those that endure unto the end shall be saved. You're not going to endure unless you've got the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And we see examples of that throughout our lives. People falling away at, the, at, the, at troubles because they don't have that testimony of the Holy Spirit, that presence of the Holy Spirit in them. 
All right, we'll close with that, and I've gone a little bit over time here, but uh, another illustration here. What are we supposed to do about the end times? Be ready. Be ready. What else? I'm going to be ready, watch. Last one is, I'm going to reinforce that, endure. The Lord expects us to endure, and he gives us everything necessary to endure, and so he wants us to have that enduring mentality, all right? Not to, to, to be captive, not to be led away, but to endure, all right? All right, well, let's all stand, and we'll have a word of prayer, and we'll close out the Sunday school lesson here.